Hi. Thank you guys so much for coming. I'm Rachel Dwoskin. I teach fiction in the Committee on Creative Writing. Um, and it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker. In Darren Strauss's first novel, Chang and Aang, he imagines with tremendous courage and humanity the lives of the conjoined twins, Chang and Aang, who moved from their birthplace on the Mekong River to America, where they were touring circus performers, lived in North Carolina, and married a pair of southern sisters. Strauss's is the most beautiful and fully realized sort of historical fiction, infused with truth that facts can't get at, even where his work is so factually accurate as to be virtuosic. When the character Captain Coffin shows up on the Mekong to persuade the twins family that the boys should be a circus act, Strauss renders the scene with all the landscape of history underneath astonishing layers of feeling and meaning. He told of his plan, this is from Chang and Aang, he told of his plan to take Chang and me to America and England, republics of which we had never heard. Coffin said we would be made rich beyond our dreams. Savages, mother said, you want to take my babies to savages? No, the captain said. He spoke the way men do when they understand that the world bends to their own vigor. It was the way Rama spoke, low-pitched and with heft. The people in these places are like me. Mother shrugged her shoulders. The people are not like you, the captain said. They are like me. Mother frowned. Chang and Aang would be rich, Sen asked. Are there many docks that need tending there? The captain smoothed his great coat. People will pay money to see these brilliant creatures. He took a breath. Allowing them to be a circus attraction would bring great honor to your family and your nation, that the world may behold what the most blessed woman in the favored empire of Siam could alone offer. Mother looked confused. There was no translation for the word circus. In that passage is Straussian collaging of profound moral consideration into cleanly rendered plot and character-driven scenes that allow for complex and contradictory motives and truths. In both his fiction and nonfiction, Strauss combines the exterior circumstances of utterly detailed eras with equally vivid depictions of the interior lives of his characters. The result is intense dramatic stakes. The Real McCoy, Strauss's second novel, gives the personal world of Kid McCoy, a con artist, jewel thief, and wild celebrity against the backdrop of turn-of-century America. In More Than It Hurts You, his third novel, Strauss descends into the terrifying territory of Munchausen's by proxy, a disease that drives parents to damage their children in order to seek medical attention. And the story is so propulsive, it's dangerous. He shows how unknowable we are to each other, how many versions of ourselves each of us contains. There is nothing pat or predictable in Strauss's treatment of difficult lives because his characters never become their worst contexts or victims of them. This includes Strauss himself as both the subject and object of his most recent book, Half a Life, a memoir that's lyrical enough to feel verse-like. It tells the story of a tragic car accident he was in as a teenager, one that resulted in the death of his high school classmate. The book is sparingly rendered with all the usual hallmarks of Strauss's complicated thinking, expressed in an essential, thoughtful, and always humane way. Toward the end of the memoir, he writes about the writing itself. In fiction classes, or in the novelist as humble cobbler image writing workshops, you find that epiphany has a pretty high rate of occurrence. It's a story. It's tidy. At the end, the hero finds himself standing just under the right tree, reaches up without quite meaning to, and plucks down just the right fruit. But when you tell your own story honestly, that epiphany thing is rare. There is no walk. There is no faded grab. You try every fruit, or forget there even are trees, and wander from forest to forest, losing sight of any destination. The only changes are emergencies or blessings. When you wake up, notice the surroundings, then fall back and wander more. Darren Strauss's work is full of emergencies and blessings, a combination that adds up to tremendous depth and honesty. He is the winner of numerous awards, including an LA Times Best Book of the Year, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and the National Book Critics Circle Award. He is also a terrific and beloved professor at NYU, where he teaches creative writing. I am delighted, and we are lucky to have him with us tonight, Darren Strauss. That was just way too nice. I want to read that guy's books, but I don't know who that person is. But thank you very much, Rachel. It's really sweet of you. Um, so I'm reading uh, something that hasn't been published. I, uh, I came across an old story in my notes and thought, oh, yeah, this is pretty good, but I hadn't gotten it right. So I spent the last day or two fixing it up. So hopefully it's better now. Uh, and I realized, actually, there's a lot of overlap with my memoir. Some lines that I wrote here ended up in the memoir. It's kind of, I guess this was sort of a, a warm-up for that. But um, hopefully it stands on its own. It's called Old Home Week. You have to admit, though, 
friends started to talk about Rob in all cried out voices, allowing, of course, that he'd suffered a horrible misfortune, horrible. You gotta admit, a person needs to move on, and Rob has not moved on. Rob heard these whispers rising at his back. But what could he do? He was a parrot in boxer shorts and slippers, repeating, how come, how come, in an unthinking voice, an empty catchphrase. But he had decided at last to move on, or to start to try to move on. I'm sorry, Kim, was Rob's next thought, as he lay in their comfy, strangely vacant bed, blinking. Oh, honey, shouldn't I move on? And then, punching his pillows, Rob shouted curses, but only inside his head. His fiance, Kim, had surprised everyone by dropping dead at 30 of a brain aneurysm. But she was not gone. She was the half-finished cottage cheese in the fridge, the lone yellow sock he found under their bed, the working assets bill that arrived with her name on the envelope. Months, almost a year, had shuddered past. He'd zombied around, talking in sighs. He dribbled away his weekends in his peepholed robe. But now, the moving on process. On the 8.20 p.m. local train to Glenhead, Long Island, he pep-talked himself. Quote, you'll get to the bar and she'll be there, not exactly waiting for you, but happy to see you. She'll be wearing that dress from the union that showed her back, or probably that's too formal. Maybe she'll have on a white t-shirt and jeans and you'll wave hello, or even better, she might just come up and hug you. Who knows how she knows, but she does know. So she whispers, I'm so sorry, just that, and it'll be enough. There won't be other people around asking how you're feeling. She'll be flirty like she was by the men's room in Peddler that one time when she said you were super cute and nice in high school, Rob. And you'll be okay with that and won't start crying because you have to do this. You have to realize that she would be understanding about you talking to her. Her was Samantha Mockler, a redheaded ex honor student he'd loved back in high school and who he'd never really known or might have loved in high school, most likely loved. Yes, moving on. The stutter of metal wheels over train tracks. Tonight was Christmas Eve, a Saturday, the shortest day of the year, and the one-time class treasurer, Samantha Mockler, as she sat alone in a bar called the Barefoot Peddler, bathed in pink light and the synthesizer music of ironic nostalgia, drinking a warm Meister brow. Samantha Mockler had no idea that some guy from the outskirts of her memory was coming to claim her. His hometown was as he remembered it, streets leading to cul-de-sacs, cul-de-sacs ringed by houses with low shingled brows. That was pretty much it. The peddler, please, he told the cab driver without having to give an address. It was one thing to aim for romance and luxury of your imagination. It was another to sit in a station wagon taxi that hurried uphill, downhill, toward what? I'm an idiot to do this, he thought. Oh, hello there, Sam. I came to make you fall for me. Was he headed for humiliation? Something worse? Rob's reflection in the cab window didn't really capture his look of enduring bewilderment. His face disappeared, appeared on the glass with every past streetlight. But shadows fanned across the window pane to underline his eyes and underscore how thin he'd become. Gaunt cheekbones, protruded eyes, the almost squirrel face that belongs to chronic grief. Bobby, hey, this is just inside the door. Hey, Rob, long time. With a smiley shoulder his way into the barroom, a press of 30-year-olds clustered as thick as rush hour commuters. Hey, thanks, he said. A few once known faces kept ringing muffled notes in his memory. You went to North Shore, right? Said Frank Hamby, the first person Rob truly recognized. Tall, robotic Hamby, he still wore the I don't much care about you face he'd had in high school. Drukebox was screaming out some early 90s seal song about being a little crazy, as familiar to Rob as, friend, as false friendship, music of schmaltz and timidity. He didn't make it to the bar without a few more people stopping him. God damn, Robbie, what a blow. This is a guy in tight jeans named Jim Tantino. Is it still Robbie? Tantino, his hair having gone the way of all high school triumphs, now placed his hands over Rob's. Tantino and Rob had never been friends. You okay, buddy? Yeah, well, Rob said. Ever since Kim died, he'd been unable to shoot the breeze with people, but he composed his face into what he knew was appealingly sad. Other people's symp sympathy had splattered through his life, had gurgled up his phone line, swamped his Gmail, and he'd welcomed it. Find Samantha Mockler now, he thought. He kept moving and felt in the, swing, in the swaying squeeze of people as if he were walking through the whirling brushes of a car wash. Most people from his graduating class made a point of being at Peddler every Christmas Eve. He'd never seen the appeal, decor that refused to discriminate a stalemate of Yankees and Mets calendars. Soggy pretzels, over-troubled music. But friends of his, even friends who lived in New York City as he did, always made it back. This included those who mo who'd moved away but who had now returned home to visit family, people like Samantha Mockler. Rob's parents had fled to Boston when the local real estate market wobbled in the mid-aughts 
And so without a place to stay, he'd only participated in this little tradition once before. And it was on that bygone Christmas Eve night, five years ago and three years before his 10-year class reunion, that Samantha Mockler had told him he was, quote, super cute and nice in high school. And that was why he was here. Hey, Robert just made it up to the bar's unpolished service rail when someone hugged him hard from behind. Hey, a voice spoke in his ear with a pretend British accent. Do you like Meisterbrow, Mother Humper? Hey, Rob said as the arms let him free. It's not easy for a guy stupefied by the hypnotist's watch of grief to come around to small talk. Hey, buddy, you mean the drink, the drink of homeless drunks and peddlers without shoes on, he said. He turned to face Bernie Schwab, huge slob, who'd managed to radiate grandeur even in sweatpants. He and Rob hadn't seen each other since Kim's funeral because Schwab still lived in Long Island, or that had been the excuse. The funeral, open coffin, outline of narrow legs in a black dress he didn't recognize, the face of the dead body he tried to avoid looking at. Now Schwab is handing Rob a plastic red cup of Meisterbrow beer. Schwab is 280 pounds. He shared a Cheshire smile of belly skin where his sweatshirt couldn't quite reach to his waistband. In the late 90s, in their little cabal of friends, in the terry cloth robe he'd worn most everywhere besides school, Schwab had served as a kind of benevolent dictator. Rob smiled. The person he thought most the person he had thought most ethical in the world was nothing anymore. The person he had loved and needed, nothing at all. On the other hand, on the other hand, she'd sung Come All Ye Faithful without irony. She'd held not so secret grudges against every dog in their apartment building. She lived thirty years, but now if he kept letting details of their years together evaporate from his memory, if he ever forgot, for instance, that she had winked at him in their pre wedding dance class every time he stepped on her toes, then she'd be blotted out forever. You know, Bernie Schwab was saying, I did better with these women when they were daughters and not mothers. You're welcome for the beer. One whole beer, wow. This came out less jovial than Rob had intended, more accusing. So Eric and Pooch here? Fuck them, is she here yet? Schwab said, and then pointing, hey, look at you, getting a little gray in the temples there, asked Munch. Wait, is who here yet? Rob said dumbly. Please, Schwab said. Sam wants her breath, Mockler. What? Why, what makes you think... Did everybody here know his feelings? If so, how? Come on, Schwab said. You always used to talk about her. Oh, Sam Mockler, Sam Mockler, Sam Mockler. I just figured that now, after Kim, this time it was Schwab wincing who cut himself off. Rob felt childishly disconcerted, and though he didn't particularly want to smile, he smiled anyway, and Schwab took up the smile. Small talk bores a vacuum. In the deepening non-talking where they now stood, the deepening unease, Rob, Rob's smile faltered. Schwab broke first. He said, you know, she's not here anyway, Sam Mockler. Really? Then he took a sip on his beer to hide his face. That's fine, good, I'm here to see you and Pooch anyway. Schwab nodded. Anyway, Schwab, what Rob said. He and Schwab started nodding together in an agreement of nothing, their smiles fading, their eyebrows held high, a pair of beat cops waiting in a crime scene for the detective to show up and explain the mystery to them. Schwab finally figured out something to say. So, how's work? He shouted over the music, which made the question seem even less intimate. It's good, you know, not bad. In grad school, Rob had majored in sustainable design, environmentally uns unassailable homes, solar energy cells, low flush toilets, auto shut off lights, the knickknacks that students swear by. Since school, he'd been working for a firm he hated called Accessible Architecture. He'd never seen any of his own projects built, though he made it clear to his bosses that he'd forego whatever ecological principles he might have held. And then in the months after Kim's death, no one at the office had expected him to do much work, so he hadn't. One time in the company's men's room, Rob's boss had seen him gasping for air, working to fight off tears. In the mirror, Rob had caught sight of his own nose scrunching, his cheeks blimping. Presently, Samantha Mockler materialized in a cleared-out space in front of the jukebox. How had he missed her? She was doing some kind of dance, throwing back her red hair as she showboated to some Bon Jovi song, arms bent out, her elbows wagging, chicken style. It wasn't even really a dance. It was some ironic bird walk thing. But it gave Rob goosebumps all the same. All little hairs in his arms and legs trying to stand up straight. He turned to Schwab in a state of wonder. His big, wide-open eyes demanded and demanded. You told me any pretense of apathy gone. She wasn't here. Hold up, Schwab said. That's Sam Mockler? He was squinting. She's a redhead? I was thinking of someone else. It was definitely her, Sam Mockler, dancing there, skinnier than he'd remembered, skinnier, taller, still attractive, it had taken Rob a few more seconds to notice the perturbed, pink-faced woman who danced next to Samantha Mockler, a second bird walker who stopped often, fidgeting. Rob knew this woman but couldn't dredge up her name. 
Her dancing amounted to a few, a few hesitant arm flaps, the kind of bird you shoo into flight with a rolled-up newspaper. Joyce Hansen, that was her name. The counting crows as Mr. Jones ended, and Samantha Mockler walked to a nearby table where, laughing, she patted her forehead with a long sleeve of her white shirt. She was wearing the outfit Rob had imagined, sort of. Sam Mockler, Rob said. Hey there. His voice too shrill, but at least he'd said it, having followed the counsel of his infatuation and his beer. He'd walked over in what seemed like two floorless strides. Samantha Mockler seemed not to know him, blinking at Rob with her lusterless blue stare, until memory showed in her eyes like a school of bright fish darting straight for the surface. Robbie Krasick, she said in a loud, abrupt voice, behind which any number of sentiments could be read. The soft of Samantha's hand as, she, as he shook it hello, the eagerness in his chest, the forgotten cheek feeling of a grin. How are you, Robbie? Other than whoa, really skinny, I mean. The years had touched her as a vertical crease between the brows. I'm okay, yeah, Rob said, looking down at his own thinness. Slowly, as if coerced, he let go of her hand. He turned to Samantha's friend, Joyce Hansen, and said, Oh, hey, Joyce, after having politely waited to do so. But he hadn't stopped looking at Samantha. He caught an impression from the gleam on her neck, her cheeks that she'd danced into a flush from the mouth whose lower lip obtruded like a bottom drawer left partway open, the impression of seeing a memory recur in real life. But Samantha Mockler was very actual compared to his imaginings. Am I drunk, he wondered. That one beard had been his first alcohol in months. Meanwhile, the third wheel Joyce Hansen had stared, started fingering at her own ear, big hoop earring, long red, long red fingernail, and her focused stare may have been an attempt to warn Samantha to go on tiptoes around a griever like Rob. This was a look, a message, that Rob had intercepted before. Grievers become look connoisseurs. Jesus, does Sam not know what happened to me? He was thinking, relieved that he might not have to talk about it, but also sort of offended. Working a sudden crick in his neck, he weather veined his head left and right like an owl. Samantha Mockler said, So, you married like everyone else? And not catching the sudden pressure drop, she added, I mean, didn't you have some girlfriend at the reunion? Rob felt his face scowl. He didn't feel like playing up his grief anymore. Fuck mourning. For lack of anything better, and even though he knew he may have looked creepy doing so, he tried to keep his smile. But once a smile becomes a decision, it's no longer a smile. <laughs> All at once, Rob felt guilty and discouraged. He said, my girlfriend is dead. My fiance, I mean. Rob had the eldest to be heard. My fiance died last year. She had an aneurysm in the supermarket. Right away, Joyce Hansen said, Sam didn't know. Shut up, Joyce, you bitch, Rob thought. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay, he said, not cracking. How could you have known, right? But his stomach felt hot, glowing orange. Anyway, it's good to see you, he said. I'm so sorry, Robbie. Samantha Mockler's voice had the bait and the hook of real kindness. Or maybe Rob just wanted very much to be caught. To have something like this happen is, Jesus, Rob, I, I don't know. I. Samantha Mockler stopped. She shook her head. Only an asshole, she said, knows what to say in these situations, right? So I'll just go with this because it came into my head, and it's true. That it really fucking sucks. What a completely shitty load to have to go through. God. Then her jaw stiffened in her cheeks. It feels so bush league to say, you know, I'm sorry, Rob, or whatever. I'm sure you're sick of hearing it, so I'll shut up now. She didn't smile or pout or look away, and Rob felt the gratitude he knew was inflated. You want a beer, you think? He allowed his eyes to take in all of her, the prettiness that appeared both offhand and deliberate. I mean, let's just say screw sorry and all that bullshit, he said. To Rob's surprise, he had an unyielding, unhappy boner. Let me start over. Samantha Mockler, may I please buy you a beer? Sure, as long as it's not Meisterbrow. Her faint crop of freckles stretched from one smiling cheek to, another, to the other. She was almost believably cavalier. Or I should be like, yes, Rob, thanks. The appreciative girl answered appreciatively. She cocked her head. But no, Meisterbrow, seriously, it's like pee. Great. He was smiling, too, and this time with that, that hermitish quality. He waited a second, another, before he asked Joyce Hansen, you okay, Joyce, drink-wise? You need anything? Some pee, brow? Samantha Mockler had a boisterous laugh, and more Rob had triggered it. At the bar, draft beer pulls sneezed up Meisterbrow after Meisterbrow. He started to question everything. Had she come here to the bar with him out of pity? Was he ready? A frantic note crept into his voice as he told her about his job. He could see himself through a woman's eyes, just a guy with a sad, skinny face, a sad sack with no wrap whatsoever. I got this round, he said, and Samantha Mockler cast her eye around the room with slow disinterest like a sundial shadow. He felt defeat spring from the crick in his neck. When he handed her the beer, however, and as she asked him something in a hurried way, does it feel strange to you, seeing all these people, or is it just weird that it's not weird? Clever, or at least semi-clever, remarks took shape in his mind and reported for duty. 
Weird is Frank Hamby over there by Alison Irwin, he said, gesturing toward Hamby, who now stood idling among a group of women, his arms close to his sides, frowning as though the night itself were a nuisance and a front. I think one of us needs to issue a preemptive restraining order, Rob said. Samantha's little voiceless chuckle was a widening of her nostrils. So it could be, her hands browsing his as she took the beer from him, like a, citizen, like a citizen's arrest, but without the arrest part, very brave. She spoke hesitantly, hesitantly, no sass of real joking in her voice, feeling her way, checking if Rob were a china plate too fragile to play with. I think we have reasonable grounds, he said, and felt like himself for the first time in months. Holy shit, he thought, I think she's checking me out. She had called him super cute, right? Yeah, it's, it's weird seeing all these people, Rob said, looking into her eyes with oomph, the culmination of recent victories. You ever heard of those picture, picture windows that newer buildings have, he said? Thermoplanes, we call them. Wait, this is boring, I'm, if, but if I'm too interesting at 9.30, wouldn't that just be a letdown by midnight? Anyway, he drew a breath and tried to pull his thoughts together. Thermoplanes are sheets of glass with vacuum space between the sheets. He was going to say that it felt like everyone here was separated by dead airspace, just like thermoplanes were, but he now realized how cheesy and pretentious that would sound. Just then, as Samantha Mockler was opening her pull-top can of Heineken, some foam gushed out, spilling down the sides and onto her knuckles. She crouched to slurp with her hand, and Rob said, Oh man, I've given beer to an anteater. She kept slurping. His remark earned him a little snigger, a little hearable snort, no less or more. Cute, Rob, she said. Oh, he said, and after telling himself that he wouldn't, that his joking was becoming increasingly nervous, that it would be a mistake for him to bring this up, he added, Is it super cute? Samantha Mockler looked at him with a sideways squint. I was with you till now, she seemed to be saying. Is that some reference I don't remember, or are you asking if I think you're cute, said her stare. Think of something funny, Rob thought, something not borderline insulting. Rob leaned toward her to avoid shouting, You're a very kind person, Sam. He hadn't planned on that, but it seemed important to him now that they stopped behaving conventionally. That was the nicest sorry I ever got. His mouth crimped with a desire to explain a gut feeling that was basically unrenderable. I mean, it wasn't a sorry. That's what was so great about it. You played the cynic in high school, but you're really a very insightful person, he said. If Samantha Mockler had been truly insightful, it hadn't occurred to him before. He never imagined that he'd always liked her for her insight. But now he was convinced that he was say what he was saying was true. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the pre pleasure of a secret disclosed had come over them. It struck them as more genuine than joking, or even sadness, because it had the thrill of a furtive but real intimacy. Not that I knew you so well back then, Sam. Rob was saying, pushing it too far, maybe. But I could tell you were bored back then by everything, and Evan, too, he bored you. Her boyfriend's name had been Evan Lentrichia. Sam's look intensified and then restored itself. Oh, yeah, she said, like I was the only adolescent in all the suburbs who was bored in 1999. Her expression wasn't an eye, wasn't an eye roll, exactly. Maybe everything Rob had said had been off base. But she'd felt that intimate thrill, too, hadn't she? Isn't it fucking loud in here? Samantha said quickly. It's fucking loud in here and I want a cigarette. Do you feel like going outside with me? And her strong voice, her appealing voice, recently so hurried, took on some added charm. She sounded a little shy. Come have a cigarette. Come watch me have a cigarette, she said. It'll be like recapturing the times we almost once had. It was pretty chilly in the parking lot and the air gave occasional freezing touches, clutches. In her perfect white winter coat, Samantha Mockler, a little hunched over for warmth, leaned against the wall, one leg drawn up and bent, the sole of her sneaker touching brick. Rob had to remind himself to quit ogling her. For some reason, he remembered how Kim used to interrupt him all the time with a context wrong, mid-conversation. Hi, honey. He looked away. Storefront after storefront, this was the variety of Long Island that he'd seen from the train's window, a progression of minor businesses hitched up against residential streets, all the green elbowed out. Rob said, does it seem weird that you grew up here? It seems a little weird to me that I did. She motioned with her chin across the street to Cozy's Electronics, the window of which announced a two-for-one sale. Next to that stood a Chico's clothing store whose message was 60% off maternity items. Civilization and its discounts, she said. Cigarette smoke halfway hid her pink and cold cheeks. He laughed, sort of catching the reference. Yeah, he said, and laughed again as he gave a half-conscious peek at his reflection in the barefoot peddler's window. Yeah. Sam took a long drag on her Marlboro, and Rob wished he smoked too, or almost wished. The AMA writes that cigarettes increase the possibility of aneurysm. If only because smoking might excuse him from having to fill whatever what had become a long silence. She blew smoke from the side of her mouth in a frank, refractory jet that failed to bring him any ideas for something to talk about. That joke, civilization and its discounts, she said, that wasn't mine. I got it from this guy who, as she went on, more than anything, he wanted to forgo 
small talk and enter into the gambit of tossing all formalities aside. What he wanted precisely was to go ahead to interrupt Samantha Mockler with, with a smile, hi honey, in the middle of whatever she might be saying. Rather than that, he went with, what were you and Joyce Hansen doing at the jukebox? I mean, you were sort of dancing like chickens. I'm just curious, what was that about? Samantha Mockler lowered her head as she laughed. That's what I always thought was so funny about you in high school, Rob. Sometimes you just say shit out of left field like that. I did. A black Honda was driving toward them on Glen Cove Avenue. The car's headlights admired Sam's face for a moment before it turned away. And you're always smiling, she said, which was kind of cool because it was so un-high school cool, you know? My friends used to kid me, looking around for Smiley, he's over there. Sam had very full red lips when she smiled at him, which she was doing now. It was cute, she said, that you're always smiling. Holy shit, Rob thought, it's happening. He said, smiling, I don't remember smiling so much. Well, her gaze didn't shrink from his. You did. He felt as if he and Sam were spreading into a, were speeding into a shared intuition. But despite the sensation of beginning really to fit with her, there are many things that Rob would never know about Samantha Mockler. It was in her character to plagiarize old jokes and then debate whether she needed to give credit. To eschew all cosmetics except lipstick for vaguely political reasons. To steer conversation away from her unfinished master's thesis. Opening sentence, for years Lacan's name has been known as that of someone who ushered in a revitalization of the attention to Freud among the French intelligentsia and indeed the world. To emphasize sincerely with wounded things and to play a bit with the men who seemed attracted to her. Tell her you liked her in high school too, Rob was thinking. Tell her she's pretty. She stood quite close. Her lipstick made a gluey pop of red between the lips as her mouth came slightly open. I'm going to kiss her, he thought. He said, do you do anything special for Christmas? She sighed started another cigarette, and then talked about her plans, which were few, customary, and trivial. In every important way, she was unconnected to him. But a warm sweep of air came in, a reprieve as improbable as the end of a Capra movie. Samantha Mockler started towing the ground absently with her right foot. Her eyes, still on him, went wide in bluish dilation, and under perfect quiet, a moment had arrived. Her eyes and their directness made his heart seize up, stuck between beats. What was most surprising was how quiet everything seemed outside his head, the velvety pocket of calm when the world is gone. The instant light of the street lamps was cruel to her eyes. It was curling shadows at the bridge of her nose, bringing out the lines of weariness and corrosion that are noticeable when any woman is compared to her high school self. Rob found her most attractive at this moment, most lovable. Rob didn't breathe nor move. Instead, he was trying to remember, was this how love felt when it hit? What about choice? He had a choice in the matter, didn't he? He could choose to remain faithful to, the real, to real love and not some silly dream outside a bar. Because, I mean, what am I doing? And as the spell petered out, Sam's smile got smaller and her face went all at once into a bewildered look. A look Rob interpreted wrongly, wrongly, as her urge to ask him about the dead woman. Oh, man, he said, his gaze skidding away from her. I can't believe it's Christmas already. It was my fiancé's favorite holiday. Well, obviously, right, it's everyone's favorite holiday. Except mine, I'm Jewish. But Kim used to sing, come all you faithful for a whole year, I mean without irony. All this in a single breath. He said, I'm not going to let you ruin this tonight. Please not tonight. Pleading not with himself, but with the fiancé who was gone. Don't fucking do this to me again, Kim. She was a lawyer, Kim. That was her name, Kim. She was the best arguer in the world, or was. I have this picture of her on my phone here, from three Christmases ago. Jabbing a hand into his pocket, he wasn't crying at all. Not really. All he wanted from Samantha Mockler now was compassion. Not love or anything else. She had the best laugh. You have a good one, too. The water rising in the back of his eyes felt like a thumb pushing behind the top of his nose. But I could make her laugh, and he was reduced to subtle sobs, no talking, like a half-weeping. He gave up the idea of showing the picture of his dead fiancé. Samantha Mockler stood there, cigarette-tossed, hands tucked under her arms, watching him. After some leaning and retreating, she submitted to her instincts and hugged him. Rob stopped crying as soon as she did this. He quit as abruptly as he'd started. The faucet had turned off. Her perfume got into his nostrils, flicking a tongue in his brain. He pulled away first. Her lipstick had smeared a bit, but her mouth was rounding out voluptuously with emotions of her own. I'm not ready for this, I guess, Rob said, turning his flushed, wet face toward the street. And maybe I'm not ready. Honey, Samantha Mako said softly. Honey, I know. For years, Rob and his late fiancé had been the couple others found annoying. They'd had nicknames for each other. Rob, of course, was Bob, Bobby, then Bob, B., then just B, Beatrice, Hun, e, Hun B, B, B plus, A plus, and finally, with it, because of a European radio that his father had given him, Grundig. Kim was Pat, for some reason now forgotten. Then she was also B plus and Hun B, and on occasion, classic. Some stranger had once approached Kim's table just to tell her she was a classic beauty. 
Nobody's ready for anything, Sam Mockett was saying now, enigmatically. Her condolence, her condolence caught Lil in the throat. Tomorrow, he'd be another of her bad date stories. You wouldn't believe what the deal was with this guy. But for the moment, she was whispering to him, nobody's ready for anything, honey. And so now Rob quickly thanks Sam Mockler for her sympathy and conversation. He apologizes for having wasted her time, he jumps into a taxi, hurries to catch the 1107 to Manhattan. And when his train arrives in Penn Station 57 minutes later, when he emerges onto lighted slick 34th Street, Rob decides to spring for a cab and not the subway so he can rush downtown because he misses his fiance Kim and he wants to see her wide mouth indulgent warm smile right away. And when he gets home, when he flounders with the keys to their one bedroom apartment, it's Kim who opens the door for him and it's Kim who takes him into her hug. Kim's always partial to a good hug. She's never the first to let go, never. As she squeezes him, it always feels better than Rob lets on. And as she exclaims, Grundig is a kind of hubba hubba welcome, the verbal equivalent to a kiss. In a minute, Rob and Kim are sitting down together on the couch holding hands, they're going over one last time the list of people to invite to their wedding, and she's caught his eye as they talk about having kids, her own big brown eyes beginning, and there's some excited bounce to her legs, a bounce that reveals so much about her happy life, her story that stars him, Rob Krasick, who will never have to flirt awkwardly with anyone else, anyone else again, the end. I wish I could write that, but that is not the way life or literature works. In fact, Rob's Christmas Eve shuffles ahead, Christmas breaks 20 minutes after he wept in the parking lot. He's drinking at the bar with his friends Eric uh, and Schwab and Bony Old Pooch. He's managed to sham a smile to his mouth, if not his eyes. His cheeks have dried. He's fooling nobody. The lights in here have gone on, gone full on beaming. Schwab and Eric and Pooch's eyes lower, lower and saddened every time Rob looks their way. But for Rob to go home now before anyone else has would be a confession of failure before Frank fucking Hamby has before Samantha Mockler, who's still here, standing by the jukebox with Joyce Hansen. The clock that Rob keeps searching out reads 12.10. Samantha Mockler looks over at Rob and whispers to her friend. Maybe you don't understand is all, Rob's saying to Eric, a conversation Rob's caught about half of. There are no sure things is what I'm saying. You lie, Rob says suddenly, sounding more drunk than he really feels. You fucking lie. Meanwhile, he thinks, please, please let this night be over soon. Of everything he's prayed for in the last year, all his desperate requests, his angry, whimpering prayers. This wish is the one that Rob will be granted. Thank you.